Japan, 1945, an empire in defeat. Yet, even as the Japanese warlords surrender aboard the USS Missouri, an elite American intelligence unit known as TAI combs the Japanese countryside in search of secret weapons before they are destroyed. What TAI finds, had it been ready on time, could have helped Japan snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. A secret air force of jet and rocket planes, aircraft at the cutting edge of technology, ready to fly out of hundreds of hidden airfields for what would have been the decisive battle of the Pacific, a massive strike against an invasion of Japan itself. This is the story of those Japanese X-planes, a startling glimpse into the aircraft that could have turned defeat into victory. Late 1941, a Japanese whirlwind sweeps across the Pacific. Allied fighters and bombers are smashed from the sky. From Pearl Harbor to the Philippines, Allied planes are easily outclassed by superior Japanese aircraft. Shocked and bewildered, the Allies can hardly believe their own eyes. They were used to watching uh, videos of what was going on in China and there were the biplane bombers and, and uh, fighters with fixed landing gear. Despite having received warnings from Colonel Claire Chenault in China that the Japanese had developed some very advanced aircraft, this seems to have been pigeonholed and totally overlooked. It is a crushing blow to Western pride. Allied intelligence agencies have totally underestimated the Japanese ability to design modern warplanes. The Allies now find themselves facing an advanced air force years in the making and must scramble to catch up. The American reaction to the superiority of Japanese aircraft was to try and find out how they worked. But of course they had no intelligence gathering capability in Tokyo, in the home islands. So General MacArthur sends out a famous order. He says, go into the jungles, find the crashed Japanese airplanes, put them back together, make them fly, see how they work. And that's what they did. A secret hangar near Brisbane, Australia, is designated to store the planes. It is called Hangar 7. In charge is an army captain from Nashville, Tennessee, Frank T. McCoy. I think he's one of the unsung heroes of World War II. He wasn't a flyer, he wasn't one of the generals, but in terms of saving Allied lives, his work in intelligence gathering about Japanese aircraft uh, is one of the most important uh, jobs of World War II. McCoy's outfit is named Technical Air Intelligence. From its small beginnings in Hangar 7, it would grow to be one of the biggest Allied intelligence organizations with units spread across every theater of war. It was really a grassroots thing and uh, started from ground zero and developed into a major operation. From the jungles of New Guinea, parts of wrecked Japanese planes were ferried back to Hangar 7. Often, parts from different downed planes were painstakingly combined to try and reproduce a flyable machine whose performance could be evaluated. For McCoy and his team, the task was particularly daunting. Almost nothing was known about the names and designations applied by the Japanese to their machines. Pilots encountering airplanes in the air would report there were six Mitsubishis from 11 o'clock high, or there were Nakajimas coming from the south and all, and these really meant nothing to the pre people on the ground or the other pilots as to what kind of an airplane they were talking about. Is it a bomber, a fighter, or a seaplane? Frank McCoy and uh, one of his junior officers, Francis Williams, came up with a brilliant scheme uh, for getting around the fact that the Japanese own names for planes were very complicated. They decided uh, in a, with a brainwave just to call Japanese fighters by Western boys' names and the bombers and the transports uh, by girls' names. 
The people who named these airplanes officially said that there was no connotation to any person, place, or thing. But that's not always true. Take, for instance, the Betty Bomber. Uh, I found out in doing some research on this that it happened to be a friend of one of the sergeants who was involved in the intelligence section of naming airplanes. There was a nurse in Pennsylvania that he knew of as Betty. And since the Betty Bomber had large blisters on the side, it called to mind the physique of this young nurse in Pennsylvania and consequently named the airplane Betty. But in 1942, as the Allies were pushed back across the Pacific by the victorious Japanese forces, getting copies of downed Japanese planes was not easy. The big problem became how long would it take? As the United States learned that the Japanese were willing to fight to the last man, that they did not surrender, that to take an island, we literally had to kill every Japanese on it. Technical Air Intelligence, or TAI, began training crash intelligence officers to go into the jungle in the thick of combat to gather any scrap of information and equipment from downed enemy planes. It was one of the most dangerous intelligence missions of the war. Yet, despite this effort, the Allies still lacked reliable information on what these planes were and how they worked. But in mid-1942, technical air intelligence had a stroke of luck. In July, a lone PBY reconnaissance flying boat was on patrol over the Aleutian Islands. Suddenly, through the damp air, the observer spotted a downed plane. And it was not American. The best piece of intelligence the Allies could have is an actual aircraft of the type that we were fighting against. One did go down in the Aleutians when uh, uh, the Japanese were working on the southern tip of that island chain. It was a plane that until now had been known in name only. It was called the Zero. The Zero pilot actually was a new officer, very inexperienced. Uh, when he tried to land, um, he flipped the plane over on its back and broke his neck. So you had a, a nice shiny new Zero uh, relatively undamaged with a dead pilot, and the Allies knew where that plane was. In an unbelievable stroke of luck, TAI was back in business. The aircraft was quickly recovered, rigorously examined, and put into flying condition. It made its first flight in Allied hands in the fall of 1942. The discovery of the Zero in the Aleutians allowed technical air intelligence to reveal its secrets in combat. It showed the weaknesses of the Zero. In particular, the Zero lacked self-sealing fuel tanks, so if you could hit it, you could blow it apart. This information allowed those forces to develop the appropriate tactics to use against um, the Japanese aircraft, allowing the Allied aircraft to use their best attributes and preventing the Japanese being able to employ the best attributes of their aircraft. For the first time, TAI had a clear idea of the extent of Japanese technology. Data from the TAI units now began to help Allied plane makers design planes to outfight the Zero. The direct result was the Grumman Hellcat. The Hellcat would be credited with downing no fewer than 4,947 of the 6,477 enemy planes destroyed by U.S. carrier pilots. But by 1944, TAI had a major new headache. Reconnaissance flights over Germany began to reveal strange burn marks on the runways, a sign that jet and rocket planes were being developed that could outpace and easily down Allied fighters. For Allied command, the discovery was disturbing. Did Japan now possess jet fighter technology? U.S. reconnaissance planes were dispatched to prowl the Japanese mainland to try to find out. 
result would reveal one of the greatest near misses of the war. You're watching Secret Japanese Aircraft of World War II on the History Channel. Just two years after discovering Japanese aircraft technology was much more advanced than originally thought, technical air intelligence would soon face another, even more disturbing revelation. Unbeknownst to them, the Japanese had already started work developing their own jet technology. It wasn't until World War II ended in Japan that the Allies knew that Japan was really uh, ready to put a jet fighter into the air. This came as a great surprise. The world's first jet fighter aircraft, the German Heinkel 280, flew in 1941, just a few months before Pearl Harbor. But it was the Japanese who were most enthusiastic about the new jet technology. For the Japanese, jet fighters were the key to defending the home islands against the big new American bomber, the B-29. But Japan needed help, and in 1944, she got it from Nazi Germany. Germany was very influential for Japan as to the technology and the direction to go with jet-powered aircraft. Naturally, there would be Japanese figures in Germany uh, working with the government. And um, in 1944, uh, they made an agreement that Germany would share uh, their technology with Japan. And among those, they found out uh, that Germany had developed jet aircraft, namely the Messerschmitt uh, 262. The new jet Messerschmitt ME 262 was 150 miles per hour faster than anything else that flew. It was armed with four 30 millimeter cannons and had a maximum speed of 540 miles per hour. It could also operate at an altitude of 37 and a half thousand feet, high enough to challenge the B-29. Representatives of Japan in Berlin were able to acquire drawings, uh, actual examples of the jet engine technology that had already been developed in, in Germany. They acquired the material and uh, made preparations to bring it to Japan for the purpose of their own experimentation. It is the early summer of 1944, only weeks before the first B-29 raids begin on Japan from bases in western China. Two Japanese submarines, the Satsuki and the Matsu, slip out from Kiel, Germany, and begin the long, dangerous journey back to Japan. But the Japanese codes have been broken, and news of the journey of the two subs is immediately passed to technical air intelligence. They quickly realize the subs are carrying the plans to build the ME-262 jet. Allied planes and ships scour the seas for the Satsuki and the Matsu. The Satsuki, with its precious cargo, is tracked down and sunk with all hands. But miraculously, the Matsu escapes and reaches Singapore in July 1944. The failure of the, uh, the Allies to sink the Matsu was potentially one of the most dangerous intelligence disasters of World War II. Clearly, when uh, uh, the Japanese obtained uh, examples of jet aircraft and engines from the Germans or plans relating to these, uh, their first source was to put these into production as quickly as possible in order that they could develop their own uh, jet technology. The Japanese version of the ME-262 was to be called the Karyu, or Fire Dragon, and would be operated by the Japanese Army Air Force. But the task of mass producing the most complicated aircraft Japan had ever tried to build was a daunting one. The problem the Japanese faced was how to get enough power out of a jet engine. Uh, they knew they needed special materials to run at high heats, but the real trick was how to compress the air that comes in the front of the jet to mix with the fuel in the right way in order to get the power out the back end. And that's a tricky mathematical problem, and that's what they got from the Germans. 
Among the treasure trove brought back aboard the Matsu were top secret photographs of a revolutionary new high powered German jet engine being developed to power its newest jet fighter. The German aircraft manufacturer Heinkel had designed the HE 162 uh, Volksjäger or People's Fighter. Uh, as a, an aircraft which could be mass-produced very rapidly. From photographs and drawings, Japanese designers managed to produce their own workable engine. They called it the NE-20. The fact that the Japanese engineers were able to take a few sketches and a few photographs of a jet engine and build their own version is a tribute, in fact, to their genius. They weren't simply copying. They had to know an awful lot. They had to be really creative. Uh, and it just shows, even at that stage, how advanced the Japanese aviation industry was. The Imperial Navy planned to use this new engine in yet another Japanese version of the German ME-262. It was called the Kika, meaning Mandarin Orange Blossom. The first operational Kika flies over Tokyo Bay on August 7th, 1945, just eight days before the war ends. Even though the jet engine was smaller and put out less thrust than the German counterpart, so was the Kika. It was more lightly built and a smaller airplane. So when putting the two to, together, it was assumed that the Kika could have been developed into a fighter or a bomber, very much like that of performance of the Messerschmitt 262. It would have been a major surprise to Allied fighters. But jets were not the only secret aircraft Japan was working on. When we return, Japanese development strikes out on its own to design aircraft light years ahead of their time, including the world's first combat helicopter. You're watching Secret Japanese Aircraft of World War II on the History Channel. Pearl Harbor. It is billed as the Japanese attempt to assert its raw supremacy over the U.S. But in reality, the Japanese accomplished a number of strategic goals in the attack. Japan's success depended on its ability to establish and maintain a lifeline to a vital resource, oil. It attacked Pearl Harbor in part to hold the U.S. Navy at bay while she seized the huge oil resources of Dutch Indonesia. absolutely central to the Japanese Pacific strategy. Uh, it was the uh, American embargo on oil which had been the cause, effectively, of the outbreak of war in 1941. And it was totally critical to, to the whole Japanese war effort. To stop the Dutch from setting fire to the oil fields, the Japanese captured them in a daring assault by an elite corps of parachute troops whose officers had been trained in Nazi Germany. The coup brought the Japanese to the shores of Australia and gave them control over most of the Pacific. U.S. forces immediately formed a counter-attack plan. Unrestricted submarine warfare would cut Japan off from its captured oil resources before the big formations of B-29s would deliver the final devastating blow. The American submarine campaign effectively blockaded the Japanese home islands, starved them of food, starved them of raw materials, most of all, starved them of oil. As America fought back across the Pacific, its submarines swept the seas of Japanese merchant ships. When the home islands began to run out of fuel, Japanese designers began to plan ways of outwitting the U.S. submariners. The result was one of the most forward-thinking designs in World War II aircraft technology. It was called the Phoenix, after the bird that is reborn from the flames. This Phoenix was a huge tanker aircraft designed to fly petroleum over U.S. subs from the oil fields in Sumatra back to Japan. The Phoenix project shows how desperate the Japanese were to keep their oil pipeline open. 
But it was, a, it was a project born of desperation because flying large aircraft full of fuel and they'd be slow and lumbering through Allied fighters was clearly a suicide mission. I don't think the project would have worked in practice. Japan would need something else to break the sub blockade. The home waters close to the Japanese coast. A lone U.S. submarine glides in search of its prey. A slow-moving oil tanker, bringing its precious cargo back to power Japanese factories and fighter planes. Suddenly, from nowhere, come lethal depth charges. The Japanese in World War II were, in fact, the first nation to deploy rotary wing vertical takeoff aircraft in combat. They used them for two purposes, uh, for artillery spotting and also, dramatically, for anti-submarine warfare. The first successful helicopter-type machine was called an autogyro and first flew in 1923. Dubbed the flying windmill by the press, the autogyro looked like an airplane but flew like a helicopter. The autogyro was a primitive form of helicopter. Uh, it was a way stage on the way to the helicopter that we know today. The Japanese were always quick to pick up on anything new, and in the early 1930s, the autogyro was that new thing. They purchased two Kalid autogyros from the United States, brought them to Japan, and, uh, and uh, evaluated what its performance capabilities could be, what, what use could they do with the autogyro. And, of course, the military picked up on it pretty quick, uh, understanding that this would make a good aerial observation airplane because of its slow speed and able to land into small places. Shortly after delivery, the Japanese autogyros were destroyed in test flights. But the Army delivered the wreckage to the Kayaba Engineering Company with orders to develop a better machine. When the Japanese Kayaba Company rebuilt the Kela autogyro, they did one brilliant thing. They realized that its limitations as a war machine was the underpowered engine. So they put into it a more powerful German engine, and suddenly they had a weapon of war. Having seen the military um, application of the autogyro, the Army ordered production of these airplanes and acquired up to 98 of them. Uh, they used them for artillery spotting. The first Japanese autogyro, named KA-1, flew six months before Pearl Harbor. Despite its widespread use in the Philippines, its existence went completely undetected by technical air intelligence, so the machine was never even given an Allied code name. But as the tide of war turned against Japan, the Japanese army would find a strange new mission for the KA-1. Strange as it may seem, the Japanese army operated its own aircraft carriers uh, as well as the Japanese Navy. Uh, often during World War II, the, the two branches of the Japanese military couldn't get on and would duplicate each other's activities because they simply found it very difficult to cooperate. The Japanese Army converted a number of transport ships into light aircraft carriers by fitting a small flight deck over the superstructure. As defeat loomed in the war, these carriers were transferred to anti-submarine operations in the hope of protecting the delivery of vital supplies of oil. In a bold move, the transport carrier Akitsumaru was loaded with KA-1s armed with depth charges in April 1944. For the autogyro, it didn't have too much uh, weightlifting capability, but by eliminating the front seat observer and putting a bomb shackle under that position, they were able to carry a 60 uh, kilogram depth charge. And it might be noted that uh, this is the only uh, operational use of the autogyro that was used in World War II. But history had another fate in store for the Akitsumaro before the KA-1s could go into action. The aircraft carrier transport was dispatched on a special mission carrying relief supplies to isolated Japanese bases. On November 15, 1944, the U.S. submarine Queenfish sighted the Akitsumaru. Silently, 
the queenfish stalked its unsuspecting prey. The sinking of the Akitsumaru put an end to the Army's bold experiment in anti-submarine warfare. But World War II would see other Japanese aerospace plans even more advanced than the helicopter, far in advance of anything the Allies possessed. You're watching Secret Japanese Aircraft of World War II on the History Channel. On January 24, 1990, a rocket blasts off for the moon. It is an amazing 25 years since mankind last sent a rocket to Earth's satellite. But this is neither an American nor a Russian mission. A third nation has opted to explore deep space. The rocket is Japanese. And the roots of its technology lie far back in World War II with one of Japan's most famous aircraft designers, Hideo Itokawa. Hideo Itikawa is famous in Japanese aviation circles for being famous. By that I mean he was the first person to step out of the traditional Japanese team structure where everyone was faceless and claim his priority as a great aviation designer. And to this day, many Japanese aviation engineers hate him for that. It is 1939 and Europe is at war. In the Far East, the pilots of the Japanese Army Air Force are testing a radical new fighter plane. At first, they don't like it. The aircraft is the Nakajima Ki-43, allied code name, Oscar. While the Japanese Navy had the famous Zero fighter, the Army had their famous fighter too, which turned out to be the Oscar. It was an airplane to tangle with. And in fact, much so much that uh, when Allied uh, fighter pilots would, would meet the Oscar, it was not uncommon for them to call it so many zeros at 12 o'clock high. Unlike previous fighter planes of the Army, the Oscar had a retractable undercarriage. The Japanese Army pilots were used to lightness and maneuverability in their planes. They thought the retractable undercarriage made the plane too heavy. But Hideo Itokawa, in charge of designing the Oscar's aerodynamics, had invented something that would make the Oscar a fighting legend. Nakajima designed into two of their major fighters a device called the butterfly flap, namely because that's what it looked like, a butterfly wing. This was a flap that not only was a landing flap and operated the same way, but it could be extended in flight when engaged in combat to add to the turning radius of the airplane. In the battles to come, Hideo Itokawa's efforts paid off. The Oscar would prove to be one of the most formidable fighters of World War II. As the war progressed, the Oscar was found to have a drawback. It didn't have the rate of climb uh, the performance of engine to climb up to catch high-flying U.S. bombers like the B-29. So they needed a different kind of fighter. That different kind of fighter was already being developed in Nazi Germany. It was called the Messerschmitt Me-163 Comet and was powered by a liquid-fueled rocket motor. Discarding its undercarriage on takeoff for maximum aerodynamic efficiency, the comet could climb like a bat to 30,000 feet in two and a half minutes. The ME-163 rocket fighter was designed um, as a point defense interceptor um, powered by a rocket motor rather than a, a jet or a piston engine. Its advantage was that it could climb extremely rapidly to high altitude to intercept bombers. Uh, it had distinct disadvantages, however. Its um, range was very, very limited. Effectively, the rocket fuel was used up uh, in the initial climb. Only one attack could then be made, and the aircraft had to return without power to land. The Imperial Japanese Navy, despairing that the Army could keep the home skies clear of American bombers, seized on the German Comet as a quick solution to its air defense needs. This Japanese version was called the Shushui, after the swishing sound made by a samurai sword. 
Building the Shushui was entrusted to the Mitsubishi Company, designers of the legendary Zero fighter. On July 7, 1945, the first rocket-powered Shushui thundered off into the sky. As with other Nazi technology they acquired, the Japanese didn't just copy, they radically improved. They realized the problem with the 163 was that it didn't carry enough fuel, so they made it bigger. This new and improved version was called the Type II rocket fighter. Fitted with delta wings for speed, it was to be powered by two rocket motors. Bigger and faster than the original Comet, and armed with missiles, it would have hunted the B-29s from the sky. The Navy also developed a manned rocket bomb for kamikaze attacks. The use of the uh, Baka bomb, the fool, or as the Japanese called it, the Oka, was essentially as a long-range attack against the American fleet. In defense of the home islands, it having to be carried in the combat by a Betty bomber would have been suicidal for the bomber crew itself. Essentially, the bombers would have been shot down before the Baca ever got within range to go on against the fleet. As a result, the Japanese Navy drew up plans for a jet bomber to replace the Betty. It was called the R2Y, or in the translation of the Japanese name is Beautiful Cloud. But uh, the R2Y was never given uh, one of the Allied uh, identification names by technical air intelligence because they simply didn't know it was there. The first prototype of the R2Y was finished in April 1945. As its twin jet engines were not yet ready, it flew fitted with an ordinary propeller engine. The final jet version would have had two engines slung under the wings. The speed of the jet R2Y would have been 500 miles per hour at over 30,000 feet, impossible for any U.S. fighter to intercept. You have to remember that technical air intelligence knew nothing about the new generation of Japanese jet aircraft like the R2Y. Essentially, they were making the same mistake as 1941. They thought, well, we stopped the German technology getting to Japan, so the Japanese can't do it on their own, and they were in for a big surprise. How costly could this intelligence failure have been? Imagine if the Allies had been forced to invade the Japanese home islands. It is the spring of 1946. A U.S. and British invasion fleet approaches the shores of the Japanese home islands. Corsairs of the U.S. Navy fly patrol overhead. Suddenly, a Japanese supercarrier launches a strike of jet aircraft against the fleet. The Japanese aircraft flying in from the home islands would have benefited from the ground clutter of the home islands. The American radar would not have been able to pick them up they would have essentially been seen the first time when that lookout with his binoculars saw them flying in. And that would have had devastating results on the American fleet. Flying too fast for U.S. fighters or anti-aircraft gunners, the R-2Ys would streak home dropping torpedoes or firing air-to-surface guided missiles. The Allied carriers would be reduced to floating hulks. Waves of Kika attack planes and R2Y bombers would then fly out from their mountain caves to strike at the troop ships. The planes would have come in with very short flight times and would have hit the most vulnerable ships first, the troop transports, the hospital ships, the ammunition ships. History had a different ending. The B-29 did indeed deliver the knockout blow that the Japanese had so feared before planes like the Type II rocket fighter could be mass-produced. But one disturbing question remains. How had Japan kept its secret air force hidden from technical air intelligence for so long? The answer lies hidden deep under Japan's mountainous terrain. You're watching Secret Japanese Aircraft of World War II on the History Channel.
August 9, 1945. Just days after the atom bomb falls on Hiroshima, communist Russia declares war on Japan. The Soviet Secret Service immediately begins to scour Manchuria for evidence of advanced Japanese aircraft technology. The U.S. is not far behind. At the end of the war with Japan, technical air intelligence units rushed to Tokyo, desperate to find out the state of Japanese aviation technology. In particular, they were worried that a lot of the prizes of Japanese invention would fall to the Russians, who had just invaded Manchuria. But the prize is not in Manchuria. Just six months earlier, the Japanese high command had ordered its aircraft manufacturing plants built out of reach of United States bombing. Japan's mountainous terrain was perfect in which to hide. Abandoned mine workings and railway tunnels were turned into factories. New tunnels were dug deep into volcanic hillsides by Japan's army of miners. Technical air intelligence discovered over 100 underground Japanese aircraft factories buried deep under the mountains. They would have been safe even from nuclear attack. The Japanese military had calculated that even if Japan could no longer win the war outright, then she could make capturing her imperial heartland cost a million American lives. The implications are enormous. Safely hidden in their bomb-proof caves, the new rocket and jet planes might have provided the means if they'd been ready. They found a secret Nakajima factory with a production line for the Kika jet fighter, over 25 aircraft, well into uh, final stages of assembly. And they found a separate production line for the R2Y bomber. Technical air intelligence had been outwitted by the Japanese one last time. TAI personnel found over 12,000 combat planes hidden in Japan's underground factories and airfields. A secret air force completely undetected by Allied High Command. Many of the most advanced of these aircraft were brought back to America and their secrets incorporated in post-war U.S. jet and rocket technology. Back in Japan, Engineers like Hideo Itokawa, the man who helped create the Oscar fighter, were out of a job. By terms of the surrender, when the war ended, all aviation activities in Japan were immediately suspended. That meant a lot of people out of work, including many very good engineers and designers. After the war, Itokawa turned to medical engineering. In fact, he was the first man to develop an artificial heart in Japan. Um, but he was soon to be called back to the aviation industry. In 1950, North Korea invaded South Korea, and the Cold War turned hot. A year later, America signed a formal peace with its new ally, Japan. Former aeronautical engineers in Japan rushed back into jet plane research. The manufacturers of the Kika, Hideo Itokawa's old Nakajima company, also returned to jet production. After the war, the Nakajima Aircraft Company uh, changed its name to Fuji Heavy Industries and transferred out of war work, obviously, into commercial engineering. But when the Cold War um, uh, turned hot in Korea, um, Fuji got back into the aviation business. Nakajima Fuji built its first post-war military jet plane in 1958. It was called the T-1. Post-war Japanese aircraft engineering reappeared in disguise of American airplanes. These were built under license for their own armed forces uh, through their own manufacturer. Um, among these were the F-86 Sabre that, um, that Jazz Def, Japanese Air Self-Defense Force used, the Lockheed P-2 that Kawasaki built for the Japanese Navy. There were even later aircraft such as the Starfighter. But one man who refused to return to aviation work was Hideo Itakawa. 
In 1953, Itakawa paid a research visit to the United States. He was still involved in medical engineering at that time. But when he got to America, he discovered something that he had never thought of before. He discovered the American space program. Returning home, Itakawa restarted the Japanese rocket program, this time for peaceful purposes. By as early as 1954, Itakawa had tested his first homemade Japanese rockets. They actually reached an altitude of 100 kilometers. With this achievement, Itakawa became known as the father of the rocket in Japan. Japan launched its first satellite into orbit on February 11, 1970, making it only the fourth nation to reach space after Russia, America, and France. The Cold War made old enemies friends. It also changed the fortunes of Frank T. McCoy of Technical Air Intelligence, who returned to duty with the United States Air Force. In an ironic twist, the same problems of identifying and naming Japanese aircraft in World War II emerged with Russian aircraft. So McCoy was assigned to NATO to set up a system of code names for Soviet warplanes. He gave bombers names beginning with B, such as the Bear. Fighter names began with F, like the MiG-21 fish bed. But somehow, these code names were never as romantic as those chosen for Japanese planes in the dark days of World War II, when technical air intelligence helped turn the tide of the Pacific War. Modern historical research has uncovered the fact that Japan in World War II, with very minimal help from outside, had developed a whole range of advanced aviation technology, jets, rockets, guided missiles. It was a tremendous achievement. Today, Japan is a participant in the International Space Station project. Plans exist for a Japanese manned space shuttle manufactured by Nakajima Fuji. It will be the direct descendant of the Type II rocket fighter of 1945. One of the many secret Japanese aircraft that could have tipped the scales of victory had time been on Japan's side. It's the most used room in the house with a long winding history. In medieval times, bathing was scarce. Maybe once a year. The 1900s, dangerous. A naked flame that scorched the bottom of your behind. And before toilet paper, frightening. People used their hands. Bathroom technology on Modern Marvels, tonight at 10 on the History Channel.